Good morning. For those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Journey Henderson. I'm the student pastor here. Uh, and, and I am beyond excited, uh, beyond humbled to be able to share uh, what God's laid on my heart this morning. Um, I never in a million years would I have imagined that this is what God would call me to and that this is what I'd be doing. Um, and so I'm so excited uh, just to share with you this morning. Uh, when Lindsay and I first began uh, our pursuit of student ministry, we sold our house, and so we, we had moved in, and we were living with her parents, my in-laws. And um, we had decided, since we were living with my in-laws, that we would take a vacation. And so we went down to Florida, we, we spent some time with my former youth pastor, and we went to Fort Myers Beach, and, and then we, were, we came back up, we actually spent a few days in, in Bluffton and Beaufort, came to church that Sunday, and, uh, and then headed to North Carolina. In North Carolina, we watched our niece for a week, and then we were, go- we were going back to Pennsylvania. In the midst of that, that drive back to Pennsylvania, Lindsay's mom texted us and, and said, hey, we're, we're going up to western Pennsylvania this, this week to spend some time up there. They have a, an old family home that, that they own, and they spend some time up from time to time. And so w- they invited us. And uh, we put it in the GPS. It was about six hours home. It was six hours to this house in western Pennsylvania. So we decided... We'd go, we'd go up to western Pennsylvania and we'd spend some time. Now this, this town in western Pennsylvania, calling it small would be an injustice. Um, it's, it's a very, very small town. There's, if you need groceries and you don't want to drive 25 minutes, you go to the Dollar General. And uh, there's, there's no cell phone service. Like I, like, I can't even, I still can't believe that. But there's no cell phone service. Um, and, but there's a lot of things to do outside and that's kind of why we were going. Lindsay was 30 weeks pregnant. We wanted to relax. We wanted to, to just kick back. And, uh, and, and my father-in-law and I, of course, were going to do some fishing. So we got up there mid-afternoon, and uh, we, we did spend some time fishing that day. But um, uh, we, we packed it in. We were, we were excited about the rest of the week. We were, we were going to spend, like, the whole day fishing. So we went inside. We went to bed. And, uh, and, and we, we never got to, to spend that time relaxing. We never got to spend all that time fishing because... We were woken up at about 4.45 in the morning. They're going to put a video up here. This was the site. That was the site that we woke up to. So uh, I heard an explosion, and, and it woke us all up. And Lindsay will tell you that um, I don't wake up for anything. We have a one-year-old, and I don't spend a whole lot of time in the middle of the night getting up with her. Um, it's because I don't hear her. I'm a sound sleeper. But that explosion woke me up. And then we looked out the window. We had no idea what was going on. We just saw this fire shooting up in the air, and uh, what occurred was a cargo train had come off the tracks that night, and that's what we saw. There was a, a, a train track that ran right through this town on its way to Pittsburgh, and a cargo train had come off the tracks that night. See, I, I think sometimes we come off the tracks in our spiritual lives. Sometimes we come off the, stra- the tracks in our spiritual lives. A lot of times, it's not noticeable. Nobody really, really sees it, though. We, we, may, we might make a series of bad decisions. We might have a failed relationship. Nobody really notices. See, what I didn't know about train crashes was that they happen pretty frequently. Most of the time, they're out in the middle of nowhere, and they just clean up the debris, rebuild the tracks, and send another train down. But this time, it occurred right in the middle of this small town in western Pennsylvania. And I think sometimes we come off the tracks in our spiritual lives, and it's very, very public. A few weeks ago, Pastor Mark was pe- preaching through Ephesians 3, and he shared that the gospel is for everyone. I don't think any one of us in this room would, would balk at the idea that the gospel is for everyone. But my question this morning is, do our lives reflect that truth? Mine included. Are we living in such a way that reflects the truth that the gospel is for everyone? Sometimes we come off the tracks in our spiritual lives. We have a... a, a mission st- or vision statement here that says because we believe followers live on mission we strive to reach the world because we believe that followers live on mission we strive to reach the world and and i want us to think about how are we doing when it comes to to carrying that out this morning i'm not talking about having mission partners which are great and and actually miguel and karina are here I, they surprise me and and they're great people and, and we have we have so many other great mission partners but i'm not talking about us partnering with, with mission partners as a church. I'm not talking about financially, although all those things that, that Pastor Matt said about Christmas coming up, all these events that we're going to do for this community, they take finances. But I'm talking this morning about individually. How are you doing when it comes to living on mission 
and reaching the world? How are we doing individually when it comes to living on mission? See, in the Bible, there's a, a lot of places that talk about living on mission. And I want to look at a, a passage of Scripture that, that may be familiar with a lot of us in the room. If you have a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 4. It's, it's the woman at the well. And, and as, as we begin in John chapter 4, Jesus is in Judea and he knows that the Pharisees are after him. And let's just say for the sake of understanding this morning that this stage that I'm standing on is Judea. For the sake of understanding, our lobby that you came in this morning, that you got your coffee and your donuts, that's Galilee. That's where Jesus was headed. You guys in this middle section, you live in Samaria. Most Jews, most Jews would have probably gone up back this stage here, down those steps over there, out the door, down the street, into our parking lot, back in the front doors to get to Galilee. They avoided Samaria at all costs. But the Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria because Jesus had to encounter the people in Samaria with the gospel. And that's what he did. Most Jews would have avoided it, of which Jesus is a Jew. But he went directly through Galilee. And so as, as Jesus and the disciples are traveling through, uh, excuse me, he went through Samaria. As they're traveling through Samaria, they come upon this well and, and it's, the Bible says that Jesus grew weary. How many people are thankful that Jesus gets tired? Right? I like to take naps. I might take a nap this afternoon. And so, so I'm thankful when I read things like, like Jesus, Jesus grew tired because he fully embodied the, the human form while still being God. And so Jesus grows tired and he sits down at this well. The disciples keep going on to town to get food for lunch. Shortly after, a, a woman comes to this well and she doesn't expect anyone to be there because what we know about uh, this, this scenario is that it's about noontime. And most women would go to the well early, early in the morning to avoid the heat of the day. They would come in groups to draw water. This woman came by herself in the middle of the day. And in verse 7, Jesus breaks all kinds of barriers in just saying, please give me a drink. He just asks her for a drink because Jews and Samaritans despise each other. And him just speaking to her broke all kinds of cultural barriers. And in the midst of their conversation, Jesus reveals that, that he, he has living water, which we know to be eternal life. And he reveals the things that he knows about this woman's past. She had a troubled past. She had a, a, a difficult life. She had had five husbands, and, and she was living with a man who wasn't her husband. And when Jesus brings that up, she kind of tries to dodge the question. She, she, kinda, she, she talks about, well, well, where should we worship? And Jesus answers by saying, you know, it doesn't... It's, it's not going to really matter where you worship as, as long as you worship in spirit and truth. And, and then she, she goes on to say that Jesus, is, you must be a prophet. Well, I think if any of us were sitting at a well and a guy came down and sit, sat beside us and told us everything we ever did, I think we might, we might start to draw some conclusions. But she ultimately says, I know the Messiah is coming and he'll tell us everything we need to know. To which Jesus responds and declares that he is that Messiah. He is that Messiah that she's looking for. So I want us to begin in John 4, verse 27. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. You see, the, the disciples come onto the scene here and they kind of make things awkward. Sometimes we make things awkward. But the disciples come up and, and they know the, the cultural barriers that Jesus has, has crossed over. They know that he's not supposed to be talking to this woman. But they don't say anything. They don't bring it up. They just kind of act like nothing. They just kind of stand there and make it an awkward situation. And this woman runs off. Maybe she ran off because of an awkward silence, but maybe she ran off because she was so captivated and overwhelmed by the love that Jesus had for her. Because even though she had five husbands, even though she was living with a man who was not her own, he still loved her, he still offered her that living water, that eternal life. And we knew two things about this woman, or, or this woman knew two things. She knew that she would see Jesus, and for that matter, her water jar again, and she knew that Jesus' love is bigger than her sin. 
See, she came to the well for, for one purpose. She came to that well to get water. She came to that well at noon to avoid the people of the town. She left her water jar, didn't, didn't take any water back with her, and ran back to the very people that she would have avoided that morning. Ran back to the very people that would have mocked her and made fun of her that morning. The whole reason she was out in the heat of day, she ran back to them. She knew that she would see Jesus and her water jar again. And she knew that Jesus' love is bigger than her sin. You see, some of us, we can relate to the woman at the well. All of us in here, we, we have our issues, we have our problems, but some of us, more than others, we can relate to this woman because we feel like we can never be good enough. We feel like we're too far from Jesus. He would never forgive me for that thing. But Jesus shows us in his interactions with this, with this woman is that his love is way bigger than any of that. Jesus' love is bigger than her sin, it's bigger than my sin, it's bigger than your sin. See, I can relate to this woman at the well. In high school, I, I was uh, the last person that anyone thought would come to know Jesus and the last person that anyone thought would be up here standing on the stage sharing God's word with you. In high school, I was the, the kid that uh, went to parties and uh, chased girls and, and like, I, I don't know the best word, it, I, was, I would cause like destruction. I would, I would break stuff, and, and I was just a, I was a pretty awful kid. And I wanted, I wanted nothing to do with Jesus because I didn't think that I could ever be good enough for him. And so I can relate to this woman at the well. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you can relate to her story. Maybe you can see in your own life, you feel like you're not good enough. You feel like you, you did this thing, and Jesus, he can't overcome that. But I'm telling you that he can. His love is bigger than your sin, than my sin, than this woman at the well's sin. See, she encountered Jesus that day, and she came to the well. She was concerned about one thing. She was concerned about herself. She went to the well to get the water. She went to the well at noon to avoid the people. But she encountered Jesus, and she left there concerned for a different thing, other people. She left the well concerned for their, their well-being, for the fact that she had received something from Jesus that that they didn't. So she was worried about herself and she encountered Jesus and then she left the well concerned only for other people. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. So the disciples here are only concerned about one thing, and that's, that's food. They're like, hey, Jesus, you got to eat, man. You got to get some food in you. Did you eat? And, and what, they, what they, they miss is that this woman who was here, they probably knew that something was up that she was there at noon, and she just runs away. Put yourself in that scenario. She just runs away, and then all of a sudden, the disciples are, Jesus, did you eat? Now, I can't blame the disciples for only being concerned about food, because there's a lot of times where I'm only concerned about food. It's 11, it's 11.08, and starting to get to lunchtime. I'm, I'm looking forward to that and my nap. So, um, <laughs> but these disciples are, are only concerned about food, at this time, and, and, and Jesus isn't saying never eat. He's not saying to, to not ever do anything that, that you enjoy. But he's saying, look around. Look around. Because the, the people are coming back to us. This woman that was here that just ran off, she encountered me, she encountered my love, she encountered my forgiveness, and she has freedom. And she just went back and she told the whole town, and they're coming out to see us. What's, what's also cool is that Jesus could have done that all himself. But he invites the disciples to be a part of it. Get ready. Get ready. They're coming. Church, we need to go with the gospel. 
We need to go with the gospel. And, and, and so Jesus is, is leaving Judea. He's, he's essentially on the run, fleeing, his life, fleeing for his life, and he stops in Samaria to encounter this woman at the well, to love this woman at the well, to forgive this woman at the well. Some of us, we relate to the disciples more than we relate to the woman at the well. Because we, we aren't sure what Jesus is saying here. We don't understand uh, what, what he's getting at. But some of us, because we're so overwhelmed by our day-to-day lives, by going to work, making sure we get a paycheck, taking the kids to practice, taking the kids to an audition, taking the kids to another practice, and then taking the kids to another practice, and taking the kids to another practice. And, and Jesus isn't saying, don't take your kids to practice. Jesus isn't saying, don't make a living for your family and provide for your family. But he's saying, look around. Look around. Don't miss it like the disciples did when they came back and saw this woman at the well. Look around while you're doing those things. Because the, the truth is, there are people in every single one of those situations that don't know Jesus that you're encountering. You see, I, I tell students all the time that they are the church now. And I don't say that to mean that anyone else that's not a student isn't the church. I simply say that to students because I help them to understand that the time is right now. That there's no, uh, there's no checklist, there's no merit badge or Boy Scout badge that you have to earn before you get to share the gospel. And so I say that to help them understand that the time is right now. That we have to go with the gospel. There's, if we've accepted and received the gospel, we get to share it. We, don't, we, we have the opportunity to share it. We get the opportunity to share it. Jesus invites us to do that. Go with the gospel. Truth is, a lot of people who, who need Jesus will never step foot in a church. A lot of people who need Jesus won't step foot in this church. Christmas is a great time of year to invite people to church, and I hope you do that. We'll, we'll probably have more people on our campus than ever before this year. But the truth is, of all those people that step foot in, this, in, in these doors, there are still more that won't. And I would have been one of those people that wouldn't have stepped foot in a church. See, when I was growing up, um, I, I had a Bible and I occasionally read it from time to time. I had heard stories of Jesus. I thought I was a good person, but I didn't know who Jesus was. We went to church a few times. I think we were, I think we were like the Christmas Easter people, but we did it a little bit differently because we would come uh, the week before Christmas and the week before Easter because I think it still counts. And then you're, you're not, it's not as busy. But I, I wouldn't have stepped foot back in a church because I was that guy that went to parties and, and chased girls. I, I fortunately chased a girl to a church, still didn't want anything to do with Jesus. But in the midst of that, I encountered my now father-in-law, Tim Harrison, and my former youth pastor, Brian Zadravi. And I met these two guys, and, and, and you see, the, the whole time, my whole life, I had thought... Christians, especially pastors, you had to stand up on the stage, you had it all together. If you stood up on the stage, you had it all together, and then, and then everybody else was, was like semi-perfect. Like you were, you were really close. And th- those were two things I could never be. I don't have it all together. None of us have it all together. And, and that's what Pastor Brian and that's what Tim showed me. Through the context of a relationship, through sharing their pain, sharing their struggles, sharing their hurts. They showed me that they were real people seeking to follow Jesus. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. Did you catch that? Many believed in Jesus because what the woman had said. He had told me everything I ever did. And she didn't say that with sadness. Because, let's be honest, most of the town probably knew that she had had five husbands and she was living with somebody that wasn't her own. Most of the town probably knew that. There's an exclamation point in my Bible that, that says, He told me everything I ever did. Because she had freedom from it. He, he told me everything that I ever did. He knows everything I've ever done, good, bad, or indifferent. But He still loves me and He forgives me. And that's what she told the people in the town that day. You either don't know Jesus or you know Jesus and you're living on mission. There's no in-between. 
We're all, we're all growing every day to be more like Jesus, but we're either, we either don't know Jesus or we know Jesus and we're on mission. There's no amount of, of things that we need to check off. We make sure we know this, this, and this, and we can go share the gospel. No, we, we accept it and receive the gospel. We get to go share it. J.D. Greer says it this way in his book, Gaining by Losing. God is like a spiritual cyclone. He never pulls you into himself without hurling you back out into mission. God is like a spiritual cyclone. He never pulls you into himself without hurling you back out into mission. You see what this woman does when she encounters Jesus, she, she goes back to the townspeople and she doesn't give them a 35-minute sermon. She doesn't give them the ABCs of the gospel. She doesn't walk anybody down the Romans road. She shares something that you have. She shares something that I have. She shares her story. She shares how she encountered Jesus. And when his story collides with your story, it's for his glory. When his story collides with your story, it's for his glory. She didn't go back and, and make sure she had it all figured out and check all the boxes. Newsflash, we won't have it figured all out because God is so much bigger than we are. There's things we'll never understand until we get to meet him. But she doesn't go back and give anybody a, a sermon or a message. She shares her story because when his story collides with your story, it's for his glory. Some of us have been in, in church for, for 10, 20, 30, 40 years and we, we can't remember the last time we shared the gospel with someone. Some of us have, have can't remember the last time we shared our story or how Jesus impacted our lives. Some of us, we, we may not even, even have thought, what does my story look like? What, is my, what does my story look like? You see, this, this text that we hold so dear that I just lost my page marker on, this text that we hold so dear, that we read from, that we care about, that we model our lives after, that we sh and we should, people outside of these walls don't hold it in the same high regard that we do. When I was, when I was 17 and, and when I met Tim and Brian, I wouldn't have cared what this, what this book said. But I cared what they said because in the context of relationship, they cared about me and they shared their story with me. And they showed me that they were real and they were authentic. They weren't perfect. And they shared their story with me. That this doesn't hold a lot of weight with people that don't know Jesus. We can't expect unbelievers to act like they know Jesus. This text is, is valuable but it doesn't make that big a difference to people that don't value Jesus. But in the context of relationships, the way that Jesus has encountered us, that matters. When his story collides with your story, it's for his glory. Verse 40. I told you I lost my page. When they came out to see him, Jesus, when they came out to see Jesus, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. See, if we went back to that picture of I'm standing in Judea, Galilee's the lobby, not only did Jesus go into Samaria, he was fleeing for his life. He sat down with this woman. He encountered her. He loved her. He forgave her. But then they asked him to stay. And he stayed. He stayed the weekend. And that tells me this, church, that living on mission isn't simply something we do once in a while. It's not simply something we do when, on a weekend or, or uh, we go on a mission trip once in a while. Living on mission is something we do each and every day. Living on mission is something that we are constantly on. And Jesus gives us that example. See, what I didn't tell you about the, the train in my opening story is that it caused a lot of destruction. I'm sure you can imagine. You, we saw the fire. It burned down a, a barn with a, a, an antique tractor in it. It melted a, the siding to one of the houses that was close by. You, you can't repair that. But they're going to bring a picture up. That's a, a house that had a train collide with it 
And that's a house that's knocked probably about two, two and a half feet off of its foundation. That's the front steps of the house with the house pushed onto it. The people in that house had to climb out of a ladder in their second floor to get out. But none of the destruction was as bad as, as this other picture. That home was diagonal across from the, the house we were staying at. And it had train cars go right through it. I think something like 47 train cars came off the tracks that night. And, and several of them went through this house. And what's more is that's the, that's the bedroom side of that house. And I told you it happened about 4.45 in the morning. It's where most people are asleep at that time. This couple was asleep, but by the grace of God, they didn't want to make their bed that night, so they slept out in the living room. And not one person was seriously injured or killed. At all. The truth is, we all know people with a derailed train heading straight for their bedroom. And we have the good news to tell them, hey, sleep out in the, sleep out in the living room. It's, it's, be, it, it, it's not necessarily as comfortable because Jesus doesn't call us to an easy life. But it's a better life. Let's be honest. There's a TV in the living room. There's no middle ground, church. You're either lost and you don't know who Jesus is. Or you're on mission for him. There's a couple of steps, practical steps that I want to I offer you today. And, and the first is this. Determine how his story collides with your story. Determine how his story collides with your story. Some of us may never have thought about what does my story look like? A few years ago, I, I went on a missions trip to Las Vegas and, and in the midst of that, one of the things we did was the, the pastor uh, gathered us all around and he said, all right, you guys have five minutes to prepare and then you will share your story for three minutes with another person. And I was like, man, I've never done that before. You're crazy. Three minutes? And the guideline was this. Who were you before Jesus? How did you encounter Jesus? And who are you now? That's it. And he's like, go. Timer's on. And that's your story. That's your story. I don't care if you, if you were essentially born in the church. If you came into the church in, in, in the womb, you have a story of God's faithfulness. I don't care if, if, if you just came to know Jesus last week. You have a story to tell. Just like this woman. She didn't waste any time. She went and told her story. Determine how his story collides with your story. The second thing is this. Determine how your story can be used for his glory. Every one of us has people in our lives that don't know Jesus. But sometimes we, we get so focused on our relationships here at the church, and they are important, they are vital to growing as a, as a Christian. But sometimes we get so focused on our relationships here at the church that we forget to go outside that we forget to go outside, that we, that we come off the tracks and we simply stay over here. And all these people that have derailed trains heading straight for them, we don't stop and think about them. We don't stop and take the time to share with them. Determine how your story can be used for His glory. And the last thing is this, share your story. Share your story. Not everyone gets a, a platform to stand on and you don't need it. Because you have a platform in your sphere of influence. There are people in your sphere of influence that look to you, that, that know that you care about them. That would value your story. Sometimes we walk through things that others, uh, that, that don't make any sense at the time, but, but later on, we have the opportunity to share that struggle, that trial with someone. And they understand because we've been there with them. They understand because... We know what it's like. And Jesus, he knows what it's like. He walked where we walked and he, he, he faced the temptations and the struggles that we face. There's, there's only two types of people. There's people that don't know Jesus and there are people that, that know Jesus and live on mission. There's no checklist that we need to fulfill to make sure we're prepared to share the gospel. As long as we've accepted and received and believe in Jesus, we get to share the gospel. 
And the gospel is this. The gospel is that although Jesus knows every single thing you've ever done, good, bad, or indifferent, and I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to put it up on the screen. He knows everything that woman ever did, but he forgave her. He loved her. He forgave me. He loved me. And, and now we get to walk in freedom. We get to walk in freedom from that. She, she exclaimed, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. And that's what we need to do as a church. And for those of you that, that maybe you're in this category of, of uh, you don't know Jesus, maybe you came in this morning uh, because you were at someone's house for Thanksgiving and you can't say no to mom, dad, grandpa when they ask you to come to church. Maybe you came in to just check out this Jesus thing. I want to let you know that God loves you no matter what. God loves you even if he listed all the things that you did. He knows them, but he loves you. And he, he came to this earth, he lived a perfect, sinless life for you and for me, and he died on the cross. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day. And now he's seated with the Father in heaven, and he's coming back one day. That's the gospel. He did it for all of us, but he would have done it if it was just you. He still would have went to that cross if it was just you. Church, we need to go with the gospel. And we need to allow his story to collide with our story. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you, if you came in this morning and, and you're in that category of not knowing who Jesus is, I want to let you know that I'm glad you're here. But I want to let, let you know that something even more important is that Jesus loves you and he desires to enter into a personal relationship with you. And so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to simply slip up your hand. And, and slipping up your hand isn't, isn't magical. I simply ask you to do that because I believe that when you respond on the outside, it makes what happened on the inside all the more real. And so if, if today is the day that you're saying, I want to trust in and believe in and follow Jesus for the first time, when I count to three, I want you to just slip your hand up in the air. One, Jesus loves you so much. Two, he bled, he died for you, he forgives you. He wants you to walk in freedom and have a personal relationship with him. Three, if that's you, slip your hand up in the air. I see those hands. Thank you. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for those lives, God, that, that you've encountered and you've changed. God, I thank you so much for your example in this woman at the well. God, the way that, that you went and you took the gospel to the people that no one else would. God, and you broke cultural barriers and you broke moral barriers. God, and, and we thank you for that example. God, but I pray that as a church, we're equipped to share our story. God, that we, we would recognize the people in our lives that need to hear it. There's a lot of people hurting in this world. There's a lot of people that, that need you. God, and so I pray that we would leave here with a burden on our hearts for those people that don't know you. God, that we would begin to share what we know to be true. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.